Hi, I'm Stacy. I'm the reference archivist for paper collections in the John F. Kennedy Library Archives, which is part of the National Archives. My job is to help people do research about JFK's life and his presidency, and also to help guide them around our archives of 23 million pages of paper. These papers help to show what happened during JFK's presidency, and there are actually, within these records, thousands of boxes of just letters that people wrote to JFK while he was president. We save these letters because when you write a letter to the president, it becomes part of what we call the public record. And it really helps historians think about how regular people were experiencing that presidency and how the president's choices affected their lives every day. Hello, my name is Laura Kintz and I am an archivist here at the JFK Library. I am part of the digitization unit, which means that I work on getting our historical materials up onto our website so that anyone around the world can see them. Um, and I work primarily with photographs and also textual documents. Um, and the first process of digitization um, is scanning. Um, and then um, I create what is called metadata for these historical records, which means that I, I look at them, I do some research, um, and then I write descriptions for them so that people using our website can find them when they're searching. Hi, I'm Abigail Malangon, and I'm an archivist at the JFK Library. I work with mostly paper records, so I do a lot of reading and organizing and describing these papers so that we can open them for research. And once they're open for research, I help people try to find information so they can do school projects or write papers or even write books. So today we're going to look at a few letters from the public opinion collections that will hopefully show you the really wide range of experiences we can find captured in these letters. And as we're showing you the letters, you can think about how the story of American history becomes so much more interesting when it includes a lot of different people and not just the people in charge. So today I'm gonna to read a letter that comes from the White House Central Subject File. You'll notice right away that it doesn't look like the letters you're probably used to seeing, and that's because it was written in Braille. Uh, it was sent to President Kennedy in June of 1963 by Colleen Moore, who was a 16-year-old girl from Illinois who was blind and used a Braille typewriter to, uh, to write it and send to the president. Uh, return address RR1, Box 64, Port Byron, Illinois, June 12, 1963. Address to Mr. John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, White House, Washington, D.C. Dear Mr. President, I am listening at this moment to the report on the radio that Medgar W. Evers, an NAACP leader, was shot to death early today in his driveway in Jackson, Mississippi. Last night, I listened to your speech over the television. I am writing you this letter to tell you my feelings on this issue. Mr. President, I applaud you, and it is with great pleasure that I tell you that you, underlined, make me proud to be an American. I am glad that you have taken a stand on the civil rights issue and I feel that this stand will have a positive effect and that steps will be taken in the right direction. I am a 16 year old blind girl and I live in a small Northern Illinois town. There are many Negroes in this area with which I have had contacts. There is one thing that puzzles me though. Why is there all this discrimination about the Negro? Is it merely the color of his skin? To me, this doesn't mean very much. These are people underlined, not animals, which we can deprive in education. And if, as we, and if we as the majority cannot sit in the same movie theater or eat in a restaurant with a man just because his skin is of a different color, the one thing in this world which he cannot change, then I think we as Americans had better stop and take an inventory of our moral beliefs. And you, dear president, have really furthered this cause. I pray with all my heart that all of your civil rights plans which are presented to Congress are passed and that soon this terrible, underlined, display will be over and that all Americans will be at peace with each other. I only wish I knew of something that I could personally do to help. If there is anything in my power, I will certainly try. As for now, all I can do is pray and hope, and my prayers go with you and your family. Good luck, underlined. Sincerely, a worried but confident citizen, Miss Colleen Moore. And now I will read the response that was sent to Colleen Moore um, from the White House. Stated July 5th, 1963. Dear Miss Moore, your very thoughtful letter has been received by the president and he has asked me to send you his deep appreciation for the sentiments you express and for the keen discernment you portray. The candor and clarity with which you write is indeed a mature approach in one so young in years, who undoubtedly sees much with the heart and mind. 
The president wants me to assure you that he intends to pursue through all the peaceable means available to him, this program to provide first class citizenship to all the people of our nation. He does so, with, does so with full cognizance of the problems involved, but with the firm conviction that it is a necessary step too long delayed. And he is relying on the inherent sense of justice he believes exists in the hearts of all Americans. With the president's every good wish, sincerely, Lee C. White, Assistant Special Counsel to the President. In the bottom, Miss Colleen Moore, Rural Route 1, Box 64, Port Byron, Illinois. And there's also a typed note at the bottom that says original signed plus copy in braille was mailed to Miss Moore on July 22nd. And here we have the accompanying notes um, with this document. So there's a note card from the Library of Congress that reads, in answer to your recent request, we are sending you the accompanying material. The Library of Congress, Washington 25, DC, transcription of braille letter. And here are, is a note to Lee White, it says, Lee, if this letter is okay, we will, after signature, if you wish, have it reproduced in Braille to send to this young blind girl. This has been done a number of times in the past, signed WJH. Um, it's nice to have this um, kind of item in our collection here for several reasons. Um, first, it's a unique format that isn't um, commonly found in a lot of archives. Um, and not only do we have the Braille letter, but we also have a typed transcription that was sent with it um, so that anyone who can't read Braille um, can still read what Colleen uh, was, uh, was sending to the president. Um, and it showcases the perspective of a teenage girl on an issue that compelled her to write to the president, which in this case was the murder of civil, civil rights leader, Medgar Evers. And as she says in her letter, she, um, she wrote it uh, following a televised speech that he gave, um, and she expresses her support for his stance on civil rights. One final point I'll make is that the letter in Braille is an example of some of the limits of archival technology, um, or even just technology in general, because um, the scan and even video can't really fully capture all of its detail, like the texture of the Braille itself. Um, so that's a good argument for um, making some time to come and do some in-person uh, archival research. And uh, we hope that you might come here to our research room um, as soon as we, re we reopen and it's safe to do so. Thank you. So my letter comes from the pioneering female aviator, Jerry Cobb. She was 32 years old when she wrote this letter. Jerry had gotten her pilot's license when she was still a teenager. She set a bunch of world records in flying before she even turned 30. But her ultimate dream in life was to become an astronaut. And she was even part of the Mercury 13. This was a group of very accomplished women pilots who took all of the same tests that NASA had men take when men wanted to become astronauts. Jerry passed them all. She even ranked in the top 2% of candidates of any gender who took the astronaut tests. But at that time, NASA did not allow women to become astronauts. And Jerry, who had already shown that she was incredibly qualified and a very skilled pilot, she thought this was really unfair. So she wrote to a lot of different people at NASA and in Congress. She didn't really get any help. In the 1960s, then, the Soviet Union went on to have a few big successes in space that the world paid a lot of attention to. And it was starting to look like America might be falling behind in achievements in space. So Jerry decided to write to JFK to argue that the United States could really jump ahead of the Soviet Union by putting the first woman astronaut in space. She wrote to the White House a couple of times. She didn't really get a detailed response. So in 1963, she decided to write one last time. And that's the letter that we're gonna look at now. Addressed to the president, the White House, Washington, DC, dated March 13th, 1963. Dear Mr. President, it is difficult to write this letter knowing it will be read by your secretaries and assistants and the chances are slim that it will get through to you. I feel compelled to do so anyway, in the faith that the matter will in some way be brought to your attention. Some of your staff are acquainted with my efforts to get the United States to put the first woman in space. For three years, I have been working for this, including passing the three phases of astronaut testing. I have discussed this matter with Vice President Johnson and Dr. Welsh of your Space Council, as well as many of our country's top space scientists. 
the reaction has been one of general acceptance. Why don't we do it now, before Russia? The scientific reasons more than justify the cost. What are we waiting for? Are typical of the response. That is, with all except the top echelon of NASA. James Webb appointed me a consultant to NASA over two years ago, but never used my services. I have not wanted to bother you with this matter, but I can be patient no longer. It is a fact that the American people want the United States to put the first woman in space. While NASA refuses, the Soviet Union openly boasts that they will capture this next important scientific first in space by putting their lady cosmonaut up this year. We could have accomplished this scientific feat last year and even now could still beat the USSR if you would make the decision. It need not even be a long orbital shot or interfere with the current space program. On a rush basis, a suborbital shot would suffice or an X-15 flight to a 50 mile altitude. Any aerospace doctor or scientist will tell you the scientific data obtained from such an experiment would be of lasting benefit. Enclosed is a file of my correspondence with NASA, a scrapbook and several clippings. I have worked, studied, and prayed for this over three years now and could not give up without one last final plea to the commander in chief. Forgive me for taking up your time, but I still believe the matter is of utmost importance, worthy of your serious consideration. And may the Lord guide you in your decision. I have the honor to remain your most obedient servant, Miss Jerry Cobb. So unfortunately, the White House didn't respond to Jerry. They sent her letter to NASA and NASA told her yet again that they were not going to change their minds. They were not going to let women into the astronaut program. Three months later, just as Jerry predicted in her letter, the Soviet Union had the great achievement of flying the first woman astronaut in space, Valentina Tereshkova. It would be another 20 years before the first American woman, Dr. Sally Ride, would go into space. So Jerry kept flying planes. She gained a lot of recognition as being a gifted pilot and had a lot of achievements in the rest of her career. But she did pass away in 2019 and she never got the chance to go into space, even though she never stopped wanting to go. When she was 63, she said, I would give my life to fly in space. I would then, and I would now. So you might be thinking, why would I write to the president when I might not even get what I want out of it? Why would Jerry keep writing over and over when it just wasn't happening for her? And I think one of the answers to that is that 60 years later, we're here together talking about Jerry and her letter and thinking about where she fits uh, in the story that America tells itself about its history, about the space program and about its achievements and its shortcomings too. So when you write a letter to the president to tell your story, it becomes a lot harder for people to ignore the experiences of people like you. Um, letters like this show that people were thinking about issues of equality and opportunity and pushing for these things, even if people in power weren't doing anything to help them. Letters like Jerry's and from women who were like Jerry really hold the president accountable for his choices in his time and now in our time. And then of course, ultimately for all time, Jerry's story becomes a lot bigger than just Jerry and becomes part of the American story because letters like hers are saved in the archives. Today, I wanted to share a letter with you that was written by a 14-year-old student in Brooklyn, New York. So Pedro Hernandez wrote a letter to President Kennedy on May 14, 1963. Dear President Kennedy, I'm a student at Stranahan Junior High School and I'm 14 years old. I am deeply concerned about what is going on in Birmingham, Alabama. I feel that all people are created equal and should be given equal rights no matter what their color may be. We believe that we are all sisters and brothers and dogs and hoses should not be used against one's brothers and sisters. These riots make other countries think very badly of us. 
We feel that if these riots continue, America will be in for a lot of trouble. We criticize Russia because she has no liberty for her people. Must we be the same? The students of New York City schools are deeply ashamed of Birmingham, Alabama, and are looking to you, Mr. President, to do something about it. We know that you are a very busy man, but we would be happy if you could answer our letter. Respectfully yours, Pedro Hernandez. So at the time Pedro wrote this letter, there was a lot of civil unrest in Birmingham, Alabama. Civil rights leaders had been working to desegregate facilities and businesses in the city, and they were having some success, but unfortunately, a lot of people did not want them to succeed. So what resulted was a lot of racially motivated violence. And this was a big news story at the time. During the 1960s, most people got their information from newspapers or watching the news on television. And what was coming out of Birmingham was a lot of kind of disturbing, um, violent images. In Pedro's letter, he talks about the fact that dogs and hoses are use, being used against one's brothers and sisters. So what he was probably seeing was images of white police officers using dogs to attack black Americans. Fire hoses were also used to try to stop protests and to injure citizens. So this was probably something very disturbing to see, and maybe this is one of the things that prompted Pedro to write a letter to the president urging him to do something about it. Pedro in his letter also notes that students in New York City schools are ashamed of what's going on in Birmingham, Alabama, so maybe this is something they were all discussing in school as well. Not only was this a big news story in the United States, people in other countries were also aware of what was going on. Um, Pedro very smartly notes in his letter that if other countries were to see what was going on in Birmingham, Alabama, that they would think badly of the United States. Um, and this is something that President Kennedy and his administration were very concerned with. Uh, we have papers in our archives in which they're trying to gather information about how much news is being shared in other countries and what their reactions are to this news. So Pedro's letter is just one letter and it's one voice. And so it's hard to think how that could make much of a difference. Uh, but during this time, it was such a big news story that in between May and June of 1963, the White House received thousands of letters from people just based on what was going on in Birmingham. So Pedro's voice and Pedro's letter combined with thousands of other voices and thousands of other letters urging President Kennedy to do something about civil rights in the South. So I hope you get a chance to write a letter to the president today about any issue that you feel is important. And I hope many years from now, you're able to find that letter in an archive somewhere. So if you have any questions about any letters we have in our collections, or maybe you have questions about civil rights during President Kennedy's administration, please feel free to reach out to us archivists. We're always happy to help you. Happy writing. Thank you so much for taking the time to look uh, with us at some of these letters from our archives. This is, of course, just a really small sampling of the thousands of boxes that we do have. But in the description for this video, there's a link you can click for instructions on writing and sending your own letter to the president. You will be able to add to this great historical record of public opinion mail. And maybe in another 60 years, people will be talking about your letter to the president and what it can tell them about your time in history, too.